and also at the technical college. They both have uh, three degrees in sales and management. I myself got my degree at the technical college in microcomputer support and network administration. I did an associate degree, so the classes that I needed to come here to St. Uh, the classes I needed at St. Paul State, I came here on campus and, and uh, enjoyed that as well. Um, I've got, like I said, sons, and then I've got a grandson and a granddaughter, so I'm very happy to be doing that. I sit right now, I'm um, going for my third term as state representative in District 14 but I'm on Commerce Committee, I'm on Government government Operations and Elections, Capital Investment, which is a bonding committee, and also I'm Vice Chair of Aging and Long-Term Care. It's just always a really good time to be back here on campus and to see everybody and to also meet with folks and find out what's going on here. My best way of knowing what's going on here is by being with people and having them come to visit us as well. So I look forward to another another great year. Here at Clinton, 90 seconds, opening statement. How's it going? Hi <laughs> there. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you here today. It's absolutely fantastic to see people who have such a deep investment in democracy and extra credit. <laughs> you know, the only thing that would make us more lovely if this wasn't the build up to an election. If we were doing this and it was like a Tuesday afternoon in January. But so often we think of citizenship as having to do with only elections and not with participating in public life. Now, you may ask, like, you may think why we don't do this on Tuesdays in January. And I think it's by and large because St. Paul feels pretty far away. Because a lot of our legislators, and uh, the legislative session that we just endured was a train wreck of marginal competence and inadequacy. It's understandable that we feel disaffected from politics. It's completely reasonable. But that's why I'm running. I'm a professor at St. John's and St. Ben's, and I teach about citizenship. I've trained probably a thousand people over the past 20 years in the skills that it takes to be a citizen, to research and understand arguments, to speak on behalf of values and advocate for what you truly believe, and most important, to earn consensus and build agreement. That's what I've done for 20 years, and that's the skill set that I'll bring to the legislature. Okay, our first question is going to be uh, directed to Tama Tice. Uh, you've got two minutes to respond to this question. With many people re expressing concerns about wasting their vote, depending on who they voted for, what is your opinion on a preferential or what's called a ranked choice voting system? Yeah, I know a little bit about it, but I don't know enough to make a good judgment at this time. 
Same question, two minutes that you have to, in response. Uh, with many people expressing concerns about wasting their vote, depending on whom they voted for, what is your opinion on a preferential or what's called a ranked choice voting system? I was kind of excited when I saw this as a question and I had an opportunity to research it and learn a lot about it. I thought that was pretty neat. And from my perspective, anything that adds to democracy, that increases our choice, that gets more people involved in politics, that's something that we need to look very seriously at. Especially if you look at the presidential election that we are currently either enjoying or enduring, depending on your perspective. <laughs> Can you not imagine how ranked choice voting would have changed those primaries? Yeah. And here's the thing, they've had ranked choice voting in Minneapolis since 2009. This isn't something brand new. And you know what else is weird, what I found out when I was researching this? Is that they've had it in Australia for 100 years. And some of the benefits that we get from ranked choice voting that I think are really fascinating is one, it's much cheaper because you don't have runoff. Second, which is equally important, perhaps my study even more important, you don't have low turnout in runoff elections, so you have an increased turnout. More people are participating in the political process when you do ranked choice voting. So I think that it's actually a very fascinating thing that's worthy of a serious intentional look uh, for lots of different uh, elections, especially, especially for this last reason. I suggested before, when I told you a little bit about my background, when I studied citizenship, public arguments, other kinds of things, you know what ranked choice voting does? Is it forces a, a departure from the binary of us versus them, or me versus them, or Republicans versus Democrats, because you have to work for second place too. So what that eventually does is it decreases the vitriol, it decreases the binary, so that people have to appeal to multiple communities simultaneously, instead of just defining themselves as the opposite of their opposition. So, from our perspective, the benefits of ranked choice voting require and suggest a real investment of energy to consider and research and see how it will work. The one thing that's problematic about ranked choice voting, and you've seen argument against it, is that people think it's too complicated. Well, I have more faith in voters than that. We can figure it out, and the benefits are good enough. Tim, thanks very much for this question. We have up to a minute to add. Right now, I would say that we're hearing more about how to get rid of the uh, current system of voting where we're, we're not doing all the electoral votes. That's what I'm hearing more in, more interest of. And if this truly isn't isn't another um, avenue that we need to look at when it comes to elections, I'm very open to it, to learning more, to hearing it. And I hope that some of you do take the opportunity to come and see me in St. Paul, and we can have that discussion. Thank you. Second question, we direct the first to Eric Clinton. Uh, in a school such as SCSU, where many students graduate with degrees in education, how would you, in the next two years, support these new and upcoming teachers and support the school where they will work? So here's the thing. Um, I'm a school guy. I'm a teacher. My wife's a principal. Uh, the chair of my campaign committee is a member of the school board currently. I'm very, very much invested in not just in that way, but do you remember that guy who showed up in kindergarten and counted beans with your kids every Tuesday? That was me too. <laughs> but I also, I also do teacher preparation myself. I was the almost entire professional development for Sartell's Sartell Public School District last year. I did their sessions of teacher training on questions of citizenship, how do you teach people to become better citizens. I was there in service for that entire year. I've been doing that in 742 as well, so I'm intimately connected and very knowledgeable about this subject. And one of the nice things is that it's one of those things that you can actually sort of applaud and say that this stuff is already happening. How many of you are familiar with the Ignite Center on this campus? Fantastic stuff is happening. My friend Diane Moeller, I was just talking to her about this last week, and we were talking about how the Ignite Center, which is preparing teachers to get into our schools through combinations and relationships between public school districts and um, the Bush Grant and all these different kinds of things. Uh, the great work that they're doing and how they could do even better work if they had actual leadership in the legislature to help them do it. Now there are other things that are happening. Say for example, at, um, uh, one, of my, one of the things that I really want to do is lower the walls between higher education and public education. So um, at Kennedy Community School, for example, there's a, a visionary, uh, brilliant, and really cute principal. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's my wife. Yeah. <laughs> and what she's done is to take a stale room, reach out to the College of St. Benedict, and say, 
use this as a lab so you can learn how to become a teacher. And one of the things that makes teaching or any kind of industry difficult or frightening to us is uncertainty. So imagine being a second grade teacher. You get your own classroom. First thing you have to do is decorate it. That sounds like a cool opportunity, but it also sounds terrifying. <laughs> At Lori's school, people who are learning to teach can decorate the classroom and can practice teaching because the walls in higher education and public education have been brought down. Thank you. Sam, the tight same question, two minutes. In a school such as SCS, <laughs> where many students graduate with degrees in education, how would you, in the next two years, support these new and upcoming teachers and support the school where they will work? I love this question because one of the opportunities I had this year was to carry some legislation bringing the Santa Foundation into the district, um, District 742. The Santa Foundation comes came about because of Tony Santa, who is a retired soccer player. And what he's been doing is bringing about this uh, great program that identifies kids in the school system, and I think he's going up to, he's got a, I, I asked him, what are you thinking of? He's got sixth and ninth graders, and they identify them as students that need help because they're having truancy issues, they're having work issues, just doing their work issues, they're not paying attention, they're not doing homework, and they will identify these kids. What Tony does is he actually comes into the, the like SDSU and the higher education, and tries to find folks who will be mentors for these kids. And that's what they will be doing. They will be with them in school, and they will be with them out of school. So not only does this child benefit from that extra work, but they also benefit from the fact that here's a, here's a person going through school that has experience of some of the things that they need to do when they are teaching to, to make all their students feel this welcome. I think it's a wonderful opportunity, and those are the opportunities I look for in education, where we can have these partnerships and I've been talking to several folks um, in the community who uh, know that their workforce is going to be only covered by about 40% from, from upcoming graduates. And they're working together to figure out ways to get people more involved in going into these occupations, uh, what they can do to, do, to get, get people motivated to do this. And I'm hoping that the more we bring programs like this into our community, the more we set that partnership going before anybody even thinks about maybe what area they want to go into. And when I look at areas of um, special education, and there's so many issues, I don't even want to go into that one, um, about what we're doing, I just really think that having this partnership beforehand is going to just enrich us for the years to come. Eric, why don't you want to first with this question, and you get up to a minute to add to your original answer. Well, the whole of Tim's answer was about the Science <laughs> Foundation, which really doesn't have anything to do with teacher training. Um, but it's still something that I'd like to talk about, because it has to do with the relationship between our local schools and St. Paul. See, the Santa Foundation, the grant, which is not a horrible idea, but it's not the best one. It's a duplication of a program that we already had in the public schools called Access and Opportunity. That was already being run here through St. Cloud State. And my objection to the Santa Foundation, which is not across the board, it's not a horrible idea, but we do not need to bring mentors from St. Paul to St. Cloud. We do not need to outsource the mentoring of our children. Anyone who's mentored kids knows that the, the benefit of mentoring is just as often to the mentor as it is to the mentee. So from my perspective, that money could have been much more profitably invested in local nonprofits to do that kind of mentoring. Could have invested in other kinds of programs that are much more local in their nature and not importing people from St. Paul, Paul to mentor our children. <laughs> All right, our uh, third question will be directed first to uh, Tana Tice, and you have two minutes to respond to this. In passing a bonding bill which pays for infrastructure and new development, is that an essential duty of the state legislature? Please explain. When I look at what we constitutionally are required to do, it's public education, it is public safety, and it is infrastructure. And when we look at the bonding bill, that's exactly what Chair Torkelson included. He had some great projects. He really looked at what the needs of the state of Minnesota were, and he included that in the bonding bill. So the House passed the bonding bill. It is required to have a two-thirds majority, a supermajority. We had more votes than that. This was an excellent bill. Um, it got messed up in the Senate because we thought we had an agreement that this bill would go forward. Instead, there was a last-minute amendment thrown on, a handwritten paper amendment that Tony totally killed it in the Senate. They put the amendment on. They were supposed to, they wanted, their intention was to bring it back into the House. We had already adjourned. Our work was done. We passed our bill. We did not have any sitting on the table. It was either because of the governor 
vetoing it or because the Senate didn't do their work. They didn't do what they said they were going to do. That's very frustrating because we had a lot of infrastructure. We had money here for, for St. Cloud State. We had it for in St. Cloud a lot of money that didn't get take that didn't get taken advantage of. We need to have that bonding bill. It was a great bonding bill. There was no question about it. We were hearing about it from everybody, <laughs> not just one side, everybody. And we had more votes to, than we needed to pass it through. So when I look at what we do in a bonding bill, this is a great example. We looked at what our needs were, and we traveled, and I did travel with the buying committee to look at these. And some of them, at first, when you hear about them, you go, eh, maybe not so much. But a lot of those were schools that were uh, technical colleges, colleges that were looking to upgrade their labs. To me, that is a huge need that Minnesota needs. We need more folks in the medical profession, and we're not seeing that. Eric Putnam, same question. You've got two minutes. Is passing a bonding bill which pays for infrastructure and new development an essential duty of the state legislature? Please explain. The notion of an essential duty gets to really what the core is. I think that's the phrasing of the question, essentially. Um, and I agree, it's an absolute of the constitutional responsibility, but it is also, I think, a moral point. There are uh, certain issues uh, when it comes to government, things that private enterprise can't take care of. This is an old Adam Smith thing. The role of government is to take care of things that private enterprise can't do properly. I'm sorry for the Adam Smith line, but I'm a prop. This is a school, so be <laughs> um, The thing is, is that, that there's a, uh, a kind of moral obligation to do those things that have to be done, that can't be done any other way. And so, yes, I absolutely support the idea of a bonding bill for transportation being essential. And when I first started this to, to run for office, I was talking to a man at, at a rally, and he had driven trucks for 50 years. He says he probably lost about a million dollars over the course of the year. He drove a truck for 50 years. Imagine how soon he could have retired if we had roads that actually worked. Think of the, the real human cost of not having transportation, and we realize that it absolutely has to be a moral responsibility and an absolute priority, which makes the failure of the legislature to do anything about it that much more problematic. Now, Dice, you went first with this, so you get up to a minute to add to your original answer. Any one of us that drives back and forth from the city regularly, or even anybody that drives a truck and goes across the state regularly, knows that when you're going down, when you're going to St. Paul, Minneapolis, you don't drive in the right lane because it's really bumpy, and that's because of the truck traffic. We've been talking about, and I've been advocating for a third lane going back and forth on 94. And the reason is, of that is to get the commerce moving through the state. Um, CMP, um, Golden Plum CMP, has stated that they lose millions of dollars for trucks on the road. Just because of, of the wear and tear of the trucks, the gasoline, uh, they have a perishable product that has to get going, and it just really makes me mad that we had to get back on this and that somebody didn't do what they said what they were going to do in getting this passed. We need that money. We need to be working on our roads and bridges, and we should have done it yesterday. All right. Our uh, fourth and final question will start off with uh, Eric Putnam, and it's this question. You've got two minutes to, to respond. With the possibility of increased revenue from the sales tax, do you support or oppose Sunday liquor sales? Why or why not? <laughs> that is a giggle. <laughs> it was fascinating. Again, as soon as I decided to run, uh, as soon as that little bit said that I was going to appear in the newspaper, I got an email about 30 seconds afterwards from a guy who desperately wants to have uh, liquor sales on Sunday. And to me, this is one of those fascinating moments when we actually did get some insight into the nature of government as well. Because it used to be, sure, there was like a moral or religious reason for us not having alcohol on Sunday. But nowadays, it's because of competing interests. Government at this point has to decide, well, you know, should I support the interests of the restaurant owner who doesn't want alcohol sold on Sundays because he wants people watching the Viking game at the bar? Or do we look at the interests of the liquor stores that would like to increase revenue? To me, when I think about this issue, we have to look at the balance between those two. And I think about 
all of the different interests, even involved in selling alcohol on a Sunday. Some folks might not want to work on a Sunday, and they might have to now if we're selling alcohol on Sunday. That's actually a big thing, I think, in Australia and in Ireland when they talk about selling alcohol on Sundays. The big interest group that didn't want to do it were the retail folks who were going to have to do it. That's something that we need to consider very seriously before we actually go forward with something like this. But more importantly to me is the issue of how this affects small business owners more so than it would large corporate businesses. So a large business, a, 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 like a, a corporate booze store, um, whatever that would be, uh, has a different uh, relationship to Sunday sales than would a small liquor store. We need to protect the interests of small business owners in this way. And second, something that I would take uh, as, a, as a requirement before I would support legislation that would do this, would be that it not simply be a municipal issue as it currently is, because then that's a completely uneven playing field between different cities. So that's my take on the issue of Sunday sales. Okay, Tam, with that same question, you've got two minutes with the possibility of increased revenue from the sales tax. Do you support or oppose Sunday liquor sales? Why or why not? Certainly I do not. This past, after the last session, I did do a survey. I surveyed the whole district, so whoever sent back a survey, thank you. Because it's my way of checking to see where we are at this. When I first started in 2013, this district was dull. But in a few short, short years, when I surveyed in the summer, it was pretty even. It was pretty even. But I will tell you, you can now have a beer when you go to the hockey game. Because I can't get that fast. <laughs> what I would like to see is a, a maybe a larger study of are we really losing that much revenue? Or is it just imagined revenue? Because what would you hear from a lot of the stores is they really are going to be gaining a lot of revenue from being open on Sunday. What they're going to do is spread it out over seven days rather than six days. And when I look at Thais, who lives in Luxembourg, and she has a small store with her brothers, and she's the one who typically mans it, uh, she's gonna have to work Sunday now, or somebody's gonna have to work Sunday. And that might not seem like a big deal, and you might say, well, she doesn't have to open, but a large part of Thais's business is trying to get people to come to her business. She's a small outfit. She doesn't get the pricing that everybody else does because she doesn't buy on a grand scale. She's not with anybody else. <coughs> she's on her own. So is she gonna make that much money and is it gonna be that much additional sales? Most likely not. What we hear from a lot of folks that live close to the border is, they're gonna go over there anyway because it's cheaper. Because we tax our booze more. That doesn't bring revenue into our community. If you're gonna talk to the folks in Duluth that go to school up there, they're gonna tell you they go to Wisconsin because they're not paying as much money. So when we look at, and I wish somebody really would do a really good study on this, and I will tell you as a parent, I've gone to Florida shopping with my kid, and they have liquor in the grocery store, so not only is my grocery store he full, but now I gotta buy his liquor too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eric Putnam, you went first with this question, so you get uh, up to a minute to add to your answer. Right. You know, I, I applaud Tamla for, for surveying the, the, the district on this question. I think that's a really good idea, and also the balanced approach thinking, um, you know, good or bad in what ways, uh, I, I think is, is really fascinating. And I also think it's nice to have beer at hockey games. That's something that's pretty cool, too. You know, too. I'm not anti-beer in any way. But I do think this is a point of contrast in that uh, I think that that, that, that bill was a, was a great thing. But that's not my priority. That's not something that I'm going to, to say was a major accomplishment of mine on the final legislation. We need to do this thing. 15% uh, of, of the kids in St. Cloud are in poverty. Um, this issue is a fascinating one to me, but it is in no way a priority. Okay, that concludes our questions. We just have now closing statements, and we're going to start off with Pam Harris. Up to two, uh, two minutes, closing <coughs> I just want to thank you all for the opportunity and for being here. It's nicer to have a full house than just a few folks here. So, really, it, it, makes, it makes what we say feel a little bit truer, a little bit better because you are all witnesses to what we think. And when you go down there, you don't always get to pick which bills you carry. A lot of times your community comes to you and says, this is important to us. So while liquor at the hockey center might not be my priority, it was a priority enough for St. Paul State to come to me and ask me to carry it. 
And those are the types of things you deal with all the time. Sometimes you don't even agree with the bill 100% of the time. But somebody's asking you to carry it, and they have some pretty good darn reasons to do it. And that's why I think you'll see each one of us carrying bills that you might say, oh, I didn't see that one happening. But because our constituents and our folks ask us to carry it, we do it. At least you should be doing it, because that's what your community wants. And you have to always work bipartisanly, because it isn't always just this issue or that issue. And yes, we do <coughs> vote against what the rest of our caucus might think. It happens all the time. I don't vote this party line. It really, it really does. Very few people can say that they don't. But I think what you need to look at too is, I invest in this community. I've been here for 36 years. This is my home. And it will be my home probably for a very long time. And the only time it will is when my husband buys a place down south and we'll go there for a couple minutes, months in the winter because he's too cold to be up here. <laughs> but this really is my home. This is where my kids are settling. I love this place. I love this town. I love the folks I'm working with. We have a wonderful crew, and I'm very proud to be from St. Cloud. Okay, Kevin, we've got uh, two minutes for closing statements. I want to thank you all for being here, too. I think this is a wonderful thing. This is really why we're supposed to be doing this. It is for greater investment in public issues, greater dialogue, greater engagement, greater accountability to our politicians, so that we have to explain ourselves to you. I think it's a really good thing. And that's especially important, given that what we just found out today, <coughs> that um, our two races, Brian and Tennis and Zach and Jim's, are the two most expensive races in the state right now, because of how settlement is. And frankly, from my perspective, as someone who studies these things, that's kind of hurtful. Right? It's, I don't really like that a whole lot. I don't want to be part of the problem, but sometimes you got to be part of the problem to fix it. And so that's part of my approach. You know, this actually happened this morning. My son was home sick today. So I, I called in to uh, Oak Hill to uh, tell him that he wasn't going to be there. And I said, yeah, you know, Phineas Putnam isn't going to come to school today. Yeah, his name's Phineas. I don't know if I said, yeah, Phineas is uh, Putnam. He's going to go to school today. And the person who asked the phone said, oh, is this Eric? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's me. And she goes, I just heard this thing on the radio about you. Um, were you in the legislature when they voted to build the Senate office building? Nope. Are you in the legislature right now? Nope. I just saw this, I just heard this ad, or I just saw this, I think she, she heard it, because it's on the TV too, that blamed you for the Senate office building. <laughs> uh, uh, is this kind of, kind of crazy? Um, yeah, it is. I think we deserve so much better than the kinds of negative stuff they're going to be coming at us right now. And I think we need fundamental transformation, not just in the legislature and how it does business, but in our civic culture more generally. We need folks who are independent minded. We don't need parties. For me, a party is a tool to fix a problem, not an identity. And so I hope that you'll send me to St. Paul. I thank you for being here. I thank you for your attention. And I hope that we can work together after November. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening. My name is Zachary Dorholt, and I'm a candidate as state representative of the House District 14B. <laughs> When we're sitting today, um, University Five is the dividing line. So if you look by the Hodgson Center, you're on the A side. That side, you're on the B side. It gets a little confusing, um, which I believe is part of why we sometimes have a hard time for people showing up like this. And the last time I've seen this among students show up for a political debate was back in 2004 when I was a student here. Um, so this is really cool. Um, I got my undergrad and one of my masters here at St. Cloud State. My freshman year tuition was twelve hundred dollars, and back then I had a job that paid nine fifty an hour. I was able to pretty much pay cash that first semester. By the time I had graduated, tuition had more than doubled. When I did graduate, I had some student debt, like most folks did, but I was able to wrap that in at two percent, two percent interest. Um, then I came back to grad school a few years later, and tuition had skyrocketed, as all of you. Know, 
and interest rates have gone up. We've been drowning students in debt after telling them they need to go to college for well over a decade now. I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a counselor, I'm a musician. My full-time job here in St. Cloud, I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor at the Central Minnesota Mental Health Center. Um, I work with adults who have serious and persistent mental illness, such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Uh, the people I work with are in all walks of life, whether they're right off the street, out of the hospital, or have PhDs and live with depression. Um, it's, I guess, the passion I have for people in the shadows is why I'm running for office again. <laughs> First of all, thank you to the uh, Republicans and Democrats for setting up this debate, and thank you for all of you coming here. Just a little bit of background on myself. I am Jim Knobloch, and I'm the current state representative in District 14B. I was born and raised in St. Cloud. I went through the St. Cloud public school system. <laughs> Whoa, how about that? <laughs> hey, uh, I uh, attended St. Cloud State for a while, but eventually graduated from St. John's University with a degree in uh, business and economics. I was uh, very fortunate to then be accepted to Harvard, and I went to Harvard, uh, got an MBA, uh, later on got a master's in government from uh, Georgetown University. Uh, like Dan, I'm in the real estate business, uh, and so I uh, know a lot about uh, negotiating with people and trying to get people to come to a deal. Um, and I have uh, been in the legislature before. I got elected in 2014, but I was in the legislature in the late 90s and the 2000s. Uh, in 2006, I uh, decided to get out of the legislature, went back into the private sector, uh, but again, went back in in 2014 and actually got named to chair a committee now called the Committee on Ways and Means. But when I was in before, I chaired the bonding committee. I was able to get people to uh, come to a deal there weren't any bonding bills that didn't happen the years I was there, and one of the bills that I carried was the bill that built the building that you are in right now, the uh, Miller Library. In fact, I carried a lot of uh, bills uh, for really redoing a lot of St. Cloud State. Centennial Hall, Brown, Riverview, Lawrence, uh, this building. Uh, I've got a lot of love for St. Cloud State, and so uh, it's great to be here, and I uh, look forward to your questions and talking more. All right, we'll begin now our round of questions. First one will be directed at Zach Dorholtz. Uh, it is, you have two minutes. St. Cloud, the St. Cloud area is near multiple colleges and universities. What would you do, if anything, to decrease student debt? Um, well, once again, so the first thing I brought up, people with students here, many of which will end up with a lot of student debt. I have more than my fair share. And when I did serve, uh, during the 2013-14 session, we froze tuition. Minsky and the University of Minnesota. That's the first step to decreasing debt. It stopped the skyrocketing cost of the college. Um, we also created and started a, a program to help folks refinance their student loans at a, a lower interest rate. And like I said, today you, you can get a, a used car loan for cheaper than you can student loans. And I think that's, that's proper. You shouldn't be making money off of people making their investments in all of our future. Because this education we're here to get isn't just for you. It's for our entire country, our state, and our community. We're all in this together. And we're also all in this trillion dollar debt nationwide. And I'd love to be able to address this on a federal issue, but we, we have um, This is near and dear to me. And if elected, I'm gonna work to freeze tuition for a full biennium, a real genuine and start funding the programs that will help folks refinance their loans at a more reasonable rate than the Fed's scared off for right now. Thank you. Jim Nutwalk, same question. St. Cloud area is near multiple colleges and universities. What would you do, if anything, to decrease student debt? Well, this is a very important issue. And it's an issue that I've worked on before. I actually spent three years on the Board of Regents at St. John's University, and so we've, uh, I've been involved in many, many discussions in terms of how can we make college affordable for students, how can we get students to get to a college without a huge amount of debt. Um, but I've also been involved at the legislative level on this. Um, if you go back uh, two years ago, I was one of the people in 2015 that was a champion for a significant increase in funding to the Minsky system and a significant increase in funding more for Minsky than the U of M, which uh, if you look at the per student funding 
gets vastly more money per student in state money than the Minsky system does. Uh, we, in the bill that we eventually uh, passed that uh, governs the Minsky system right now, uh, we had for those people who are from families that don't get Pell Grants, don't get state grants, uh, we had about a 3% increase in the first year, and then this year we froze tuition. And so like Zach, I think that we really need to try to keep tuition under control, particularly for those people who are from needy families, from challenged families. You know, free college tuition for everyone would be nice, but on the other hand, you know, people who are from wealthy families, I think that they need to be able to contribute. Uh, people who can afford it uh, need to be able to pay because it costs money to run an institution like this and run it right and give everyone a good education. Beyond that, though, we also need to look at some of the things that are driving costs. We need to look at uh, various things within the college system. Uh, the, uh, the Minsky Home Office is a significant driver of costs that takes a lot of student funding. There are a lot of administrative costs. If you look historically, we're spending a lot more of the budget on administration than we used to. Another bill I supported that passed this last year would uh, use technology more to get rid of the increasing cost of textbooks. That's a big, big cost, as all of you know, and as someone who's got a couple of kids in college knows too. So those are a few ideas I would have, and I see my time is up, so I'll move on to the next question. All right, I guess I can go to Zach. Yes, Zach, you can get up to a minute to amend your original answer. I'll see if I can get this all in with a minute. So during my opponent's tenure, tuition rose by 160%. I was a freshman who was in office, I graduated he was in office. My tuition more than doubled. Second of all, he voted to cut the Pell Grants by $53 million. When I was there, we busted our butt to raise them by $75 million because it was low-income students who were having more difficulty coming to school. So we expanded access to grants and we kept costs under control. We went after the Minsky Higher Ed Office, which I don't both agree on, is, is bloated. So there's, there's plenty of room to cut. But when it comes to tuition and debt, I ask you to look at who walks the walk and, and who talks it. And for the one term I was there, I walked and I walked the line hard as vice chair of higher ed committee. And I'm going to do that again if you like me, if like me, Senator St. Paul. All right, we're going to uh, move on to our uh, next question. This is going to be directed first to uh, Jim Knobloch. There is a great deal of pressure at the legislature to vote with your political party and the special interests that are funding them. What is your record in voting opposite your political party on bills that have been up for vote in the legislature? You have two minutes. Well, first of all, I do have to respond to a few things Zach said. Um, uh, yes, I was there during a time of great budget crisis back in the uh, early 2000s. And uh, frankly, uh, I was one of the people that kept higher education from being cut further. If you look back, you will see votes where I proposed more funding than eventually the governor or the Democratic Senate agreed with. And so that was an area that I was trying to struggle and work on. And I, you know, Pell Grant, Zach, I guess I, uh, last I heard, I thought that a Pell Grant was a federal grant. You mean something else? Okay, well, anyway, uh, they're federal grants, folks. Um, but, uh, you know, there, in terms of the questions, um, this is one of the big differences between us. Um, you know, if you look at the last legislative session, I guess I feel I was one of the people that showed an ability to work across party lines and get things done. The one big bill that got done this last year, the supplemental finance bill, was the bill that I was the House author of. Uh, it basically had all the different subjects in it except for transportation, bonding, and taxes. And uh, we did get that bill done because I've got a reputation for being able to work across the aisle and get things done. In fact, the Pioneer Press newspaper rated me this last two years as having the most independent bipartisan voting record of any Republican. Zach's record when he was in office is that he voted for every single bill that passed the DFL-controlled House. He was only one of two House members that voted for every single bill that passed the DFL-controlled House. So if you are a Democrat and you want someone who's going to vote for every single bill and uh, not exercise his own thinking about it, then you ought to vote for Zach. If you want someone who's more independent and has got a record of being independent, I guess I'd ask for your consideration. Zach Dorol, you have the two minutes to respond to this question. There's a great deal of pressure at the legislature to vote with your political party and the special interests that are funding them. 
What is your record in voting opposite your political party on bills that have been up for a vote in the legislature? Is a, is a good question. Um, we're running, excuse me, bipartisan to bipartisan state. We want to be representing who we're trying to represent. I'm not shy of my record. I am a Democrat. I don't try to hide that. When I was there, I voted my conscience and my constituents first before voting in the party. And I will continue to do it. Once again, I'm not shy about my record. I'm not afraid to tell you that I'm a progressive and a Democrat. Um, there are several examples of when I did vote against my party. Um, Representative Knobloch refers to this 100% voting with the party that passed the bills. A comparison was made to the then share of ways and means. So you can compare one person, one person, make a lot of statistics. I was the only Democrat of the 25 legislators in the entire 6th congressional district. And I went above and beyond to reach out to my neighboring legislators to make sure that we did things not just for St. Cloud, but for the entire area. And there were plenty of bills that were passed <coughs> that benefited the entire St. Cloud area. I also carried bills, um, one that um, my party's big anger, that angered them was the truck weights bill, which Representative Knobloch carried, and um, that angered a lot of people in my party. Um, also voted to keep what was the, called the Sunset Commission um, in the in the bill, which my uh, predecessor had authored, a uh, Republican, and I thought that was a decent idea. I was the only Democrat who voted, the only Democrat who voted against uh, taking that out of that bill. Um, and I worked with uh, Republican Senator John Peterson on many, many different issues. The public-private par partnership bill for transportation. You should have seen the emails from uh, the, a lot of people in my party and uh, some other unions who were just angry, so angry that how could you put your name on, on, on that bill's act? Because it was about creating conversation for not just my district, but for our, our entire St. Cloud area. You have not a lot, you went first on this question, so you get up to a minute to add to your answer. Well, it's easy to introduce a bill at the legislature and say you're for something, and then never have anything happen to try to move it or promote it. Uh, again, I would just remind you, going back, if you look at Zach's record, the two years he was in, when the Democrats controlled the House of Representatives, he was one of only two House members out of 134 that voted for every single one of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bills that passed the Minnesota House that year. Uh, by comparison, myself, a nonpartisan source, St. Paul Pioneer Press newspaper, rated my voting record for the last two years as the most independent, most bipartisan voting record of any Republican. So you got the Republicans here, the most conservative extreme ones. You got the Democrats over here. I was here in the middle. Uh, so if you want someone again who uh, is, I believe, using some independent thinking, listening to your district, doing what he thinks is right, listening to his constituents, and not just walking with what his party wants him to do, I guess I would submit that I'm your guy, and I could give plenty of examples, such as the North Star <coughs> Corridor that I pushed, uh, where I went against my party. All right, our, our third question is going to be uh, directed to Zach Dorholz. The Republican Party has been on the forefront of legislative attempts to limit the rights of the LGBT community. Many states have experienced the severe economic fallout from initiatives like this, or like these. Is it fiscally irresponsible <coughs> to push laws of this kind, and why? Um, so this would probably be the most striking difference between my opponent and me, is where we stand on supporting those who are different from each other. Um, I was the co-author of the bill that legalized same-sex marriage in Minnesota. Um, I'm not shy of that. I was a good American <coughs> therapy from Catholic University, and I believe that that brought people together. The bill you referred to, I believe in this question, is also known in North Carolina as uh, House Bill 2. And if anybody watched ESPN or follow college sports, that few of you, then you notice that the NCAA, what did they do? They pulled their tournament games out of North Carolina because of that bill. Because that bill purposefully treats people whom we perceive to be different than us as lesser, the North Carolina lost $17 million in tax revenues due to 
was NCAA tournament games being held here in the state. Um, we talk about these things as social issues only, but they become more and more as time goes down the line as economic issues. Whether it's companies flying from Indiana for their uh, anti-gay bills, or other states, or threatening states to leave. Um, it's, these bills are not just purposefully divisive, but they have created uh, economic dry zones in places where often college activity used to happen. North Carolina was known for their big games, and NCAA is not going to be playing their playoff games there because their governor and legislature chose to treat others who they perceive to be different than them as less than equal. Jim Knobloch, same question. The Republican Party has been on the forefront of legislative attempts to limit the rights of the LGBT community. Many states have experienced severe economic fallout from initiatives like these. Is it fiscally irresponsible to push laws of this kind and why? Yeah, well, first of all, let me say one thing that I've done for the LGBT community in the past two years, and that is that we've had a problem with the Human Rights Office in St. Cloud for a while not being adequately funded. This goes back a number of years. In fact, uh, when I took office, I think we were, or shortly after that, we were down to having one person there one day a month to address human rights issues in the St. Cloud area. And uh, something that I got in the supplemental budget bill that I was the House author of, that I said I was able to get passed into law this year, was an appropriation to hire two full-time people that are now going to be staffing at St. Cloud Human Rights Office. And they're going to work on all sorts of human rights issues. I mean, they are going to be able to work on LGBT discrimination issues, but also racial, religion, other discrimination issues. And so that is something that uh, we've really needed, I think. Uh, protecting human rights is something the government should do, and I'm proud to have been involved in it. But the bill that uh, Zach is talking about really is uh, talking about uh, transgender issues. And where we differ is I think that people, yes, transgenders have rights, but there's a long established right to privacy in this country too. And right now, uh, what Zach is basically opposed to is a bill that I signed on to that said that if a man, for example, a person who's born a man, uh, decides that uh, really uh, he is a woman uh, and wants to go into a woman's locker room and wants to shower next to women in women's locker rooms, that no, that person can't do that. You know, there are no absolute rights in this country. You've got the right to freedom of speech, but you don't have the right to lie about someone and cause them financial harm. You got the right to keep and bear arms, but appropriately not if you've been certified to be mentally ill and dangerous. Transgenders have rights, but other people have rights too. And I think that it is appropriate that uh, we pass legislation that says that other people's rights to privacy are protected. Zach Gorbel, you went first with this question, so you've had up to a minute to add to your original answer. So you hear this. Transgender, people who are transgender have rights, but, but, the bill he's referring to is identical to the bill that passed in North Carolina. It's not about privacy. It's about dividing us and distracting us from the issues that really affect us. Yes. I'm a therapist at a mental health center. I've worked with members of the LGBT community, LGBTQIA community, all of them. And time after time, I come across one or another who's been kicked out of their house or shamed by their community or their church simply because of who they are. Many of them have taken drastic measures to end their own life. This bill is harmful, it's downright mean, and it's disrespectful to everyone here. All right, we're going to move on to our. Woo! Jim Knobloch, you have two minutes to respond to this question. Legislators are often called upon to set priorities between funding for college tuition and other projects, such as the new $90 million legislative office building that was recently built. Did you support funding this building project instead of putting college tuition first? And if so, why or why not? 
well as the budget chair down at the legislature, uh, we have way more requests come to us for funding various worthy projects than we have funds available. And so uh, to me, you certainly are looking for projects that are unworthy to not fund so you can put them towards good use. Now, I wasn't in the legislature when the new $90 million legislative office building funding was approved. Zach was, and he voted for it. But I was very opposed to it. I, in fact, tried to stop the lawsuit I was involved in. You know, we don't have any more senators or House members uh, than we had 50 years ago. Uh, we don't need a new $90 million plush legislative office building. We just don't. And, uh, you know, that's another difference between uh, Zach and I. I mean, Zach voted for it. I uh, made it quite clear that I wouldn't have voted for it. I want to prioritize uh, spending towards important things, higher education being one, education uh, E12 being another, you know, there's lots of other priorities the state has, but this is one thing that was a big waste of money that should have never been built. Zach Norholt, you've got uh, Zach Norholt, you've got uh, two minutes to respond to the same question. Legislators are often called upon to set priorities between funding for college tuition and other projects, such as the new $90 million legislative office building that was recently built. Did you support funding this building project instead of putting college tuition first? And if so, why or why not? Uh, simple answer that yes, I support it. It's a reason of accessibility. And it was one of the few things that folks could pull out of what was, I believe, a good bill to distract, once again, from the real issues. This is in, the, the, the building issue has been an issue that's been kicked down the can for a long time. And it's a complex issue. So I could spend five minutes explaining the reasons we needed, but bottom line is accessibility. Uh, running out of room at the Capitol building where the Senate was housed. You couldn't visit with senators. Um, we're talking um, uh, people use wheelchairs or other devices, uh, mobility devices. It was completely inaccessible. Uh, so if you want access to your legislators, we made it easier for you. At the same time, Rose tuition and added $75 million to the state aid grant program. So, we had two for one man. Well, first of all, uh, the state capitol and the state office building located next to it where a lot of the other legislative offices already are, and which had room for the offices that are now in the new legislative office building already had handicapped accessibility, but I will agree with Zach that the Capitol needed more accessibility than it had, uh, but some years ago there was a significant renovation project passed to renovate the Capitol. I think just about everyone agrees that we needed to put some more money into renovating it. It hadn't been renovated for a long time, and as part of that we were adding some additional accessibility. But we didn't need to spend $90 million on a new legislative office building to have more accessibility in the Capitol, a different building. Uh, yes, we need accessibility in the Capitol. We mostly had it. We spent the money to make sure we had it. We didn't need to waste $90 million on a new building where the money could have gone to other things that were more important. All right, that concludes the uh, question part of this uh, debate. So we're going to go down to closing statements. We'll start with... Uh, Zach Dorholt, you've got up to uh, two minutes to give your closing statement. Uh, two minutes. I want to thank you for this panel. Zach Luther, House District 14B. Um, where you're sitting here today is where I sat for undergrad, community development and uh, film studies. I received a master's in rehabilitation counseling. I uh, went on to get another graduate degree in marriage and family therapy. My full-time job is dedicated to helping people improve their lives. And that's what I believe, as uh, late Senator Colwell said, politics is about the improvement of people's lives. Uh, or Senator Nonblock and I, we're not the government, okay? Government is not a spectator sport. It involves everyone here to be involved. Whether you're a student, mom, dad, sister, brother, it requires everybody to be involved. And if elected, I'm gonna make sure that we prioritize inclusivity. We're prioritizing campaign finance 
So all these outside mailers bombarding me, don't do that anymore. I know it's getting annoying. I want that outside money gone out of politics. We need campaign finance reform now. And I'm gonna make sure that bottom line, every time you look at the numbers and the budget is put in front of me, that we never forget the lives that are attached to those dollars. Because there's more, so much more about just dollars and cents going to that. Um, I think I did a pretty good job. Lost by 69 votes, um, not giving up, and uh, appreciate your support. I'll be hanging around afterwards to answer any questions you have. Um, I'm a professional listener, so I'd rather hear what you have to say. Sure. Well, thank you also, everyone, for coming, and I really appreciate uh, your coming and getting educated and being involved here, and I uh, will also be staying afterwards to see if people have any questions they want to ask of me. You know, St. Cloud State has a real special place in my heart. I uh, talked to you a little bit about how I had, you know, a few classes here as an undergrad, but my parents actually met here. Uh, my parents actually met at St. Cloud State. In fact, my mom used to live in Lawrence Hall, and it was really special for me uh, when Lawrence Hall needed to be renovated, that I actually got to carry the bill that had the money for renovating Lawrence Hall, the place that my mom used to live once upon a time. And as I mentioned before, and there's materials in the back on it too, I have uh, been involved over the years in doing a tremendous number of projects here at St. Cloud State. I am the author of the Eastman Hall bill too. I'd really like to see that get done. We passed it in the House. Uh, it didn't make it through the Senate. I wish the governor would call us back to a special session so that we could accomplish that. But only the governor can call us back, and so that's that's really his call. But uh, if you do reelect me, you can certainly be confident that I will be fighting for St. Cloud State. And as I mentioned too, I'm someone who works with both sides of the aisle. I've got a demonstrative record of working with both sides of the aisle. This last year, the one major finance bill that got done and passed into law was the one that I was the House author of. We had a lot of good things for it for our community. I talked about the human rights bill, but we also had early childhood funding, significant early childhood funding for District 742. Uh, we had increased funding to combat sex trafficking, which has really been a scourge in this community. We had a lot of really great things in that bill that are helping our community. And my record is one of working across party lines. My record is one of voting with the Democrats when I think that that's appropriate, or voting against the Republicans uh, if I think that's appropriate. And I'd appreciate uh, your willingness to consider me as someone who really listens to both sides and does what is right. Thanks a lot for coming today. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you all for being here. I want to thank the College of Republicans and Democrats, uh, together with SESU, for putting this together. Many people would ask me why I would be running for the state senate. Why would I? Why would I enter the arena? And the answer is very simple. Uh, I lived in this community about 30 years. It's been very good to me. It has supported my family. It's supported my business. It supported me while I was an attorney. But when John Peterson did not uh, or decided not to run, I felt that this was an opportunity to put something back into the community. Just a little bit about me. I've been an attorney for about 30 years. Uh, during that time, it was my job to bring parties together who really didn't even want to be together, not even in the same room. Uh, so my job was to try and reach settlement between those parties. Uh, I did that for almost 30 years. I then went on to become a business, small business owner. The uh, thing that is important that I think we should keep in mind is we need to use critical thinking when we are working with political issues. We have to examine ideas, and all ideas. Just because you're on one side of the aisle or the other doesn't mean you have a monopoly on ideas. <coughs> The other thing is, is that we need to take those ideas and put them into what I call the crucible of reason. 
We must look for logical conclusions. We must carry things out to their logical end and look for unintended consequences. This is the way I approach things. This is the way I approach the attorney, and this is how I intend to approach it as your state senator. I appreciate your time, and thank you for coming. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Walgamott, and I'm running for the Minnesota Senate right here in St. Cloud, District 14. I uh, just really want to thank everyone for being here. I got to uh, meet with some students before, and hope to meet with more afterwards. But uh, I know you have a lot going on with papers and tests and everything else that college life throws at you. So to have this, this room full of, of such fresh, energetic people is really exciting. A uh, little bit about me. I live here in St. Cloud with my wife, Nicole, and our two beautiful daughters. Uh, Lily, who is a fourth grader at Oak Hill, and Polly, who is a 10-month-old, who just learned how to crawl. And, uh, um, yeah, and I'm uh, running for the Senate because, I'll be honest with you, I was so disappointed with all the bickering and the procrastinating and gridlock we've been getting lately. Uh, there is so much at stake in this election and for our community, in all corners of our community, but particularly here on campus. Um, for the past month, month and a half, I've had the, the great privilege of getting to go with uh, some college students, some who are here tonight, uh, through the dorms and, and registering students to vote. And there's so much at stake with, uh, with our colleges and universities here in St. Cloud. Our state has not done a good enough job of making you a priority. And I want to change that. Um, there are key projects throughout our state and throughout our community that haven't been funded because of the gridlock. Uh, especially here on campus, uh, Eastman Hall, we've got to get it renovated. Uh, so the stakes are, are so high and we can't afford to keep electing these same old, out of touch, ineffective, good old boy politicians. We need somebody who's going to bring a fresh perspective, who's going to be accountable, and who's going to work extremely hard to bring people together to get things done. That's why I'm running for the Senate. And I, I'm excited to hear your questions and, and get to know you better throughout the conversation tonight. All right. Thank you, candidate. And now we begin with the uh, question portion of the debate. I'm going to ask a question. Each of you will get a uh, two minutes to respond to it. And the first person, though, that answers the question, which will be uh, uh, Jerry Ralph, uh, you will get a one minute, up to a one minute response. Uh, something you want to add to your original answer uh, and then we'll flip flop the beginning and get to the first question the next question after that so the first question is do you believe that there are systematic issues with our criminal justice system with regards to the treatment of racial minorities well let me answer that question by saying that regardless of the circumstances whether there is bias or not good community relations is good policy so what we want to do is foster the idea that it doesn't matter whether there's bias or not. We should be treating it as, as if we are trying to create a community between the law enforcement and between the various segments in the community. So I want to first of all say I absolutely salute uh, Chief Anderson and Mayor Kleiss for the work they've done in the community to try to bring people together. The police department is, is well trained. They have tried to build social capital. They are engaging in projects such as the Top House, which is going to be a project on the south side that will involve three dedicated officers as well as other service providers in a, in a, in a uh, excuse me, a building right within the, in the local area. This, I think, is an extremely important method of building community relationships. I think it's also important that we build relationships between the various segments of the community, that we should not ignore the fact that we have a very diverse and actually, I think, wonderful community here. So in terms of dealing with bias and prejudice, the more, in, the more that we can do to have the police departments and the administration create policies that bring people together, I think that in itself will take us a long ways towards curing any bias that does exist. So as I say before, I don't think it matters that it's there as long as we take the right steps in the community to bring people together. 
And one more, I'll ask the question again. You've got a few minutes. Do you believe that there are systemic issues with our criminal justice system with regards to the treatment of racial minorities? Well, I'm a, a very strong believer in our country's national motto, e pluribus unum, which means out of many, we are one. We are one community. And whether it be within our criminal justice system, within our economy, within our schools, with our health care, within any segment of our society, there is no room for discrimination or intolerance here in the state of Minnesota. And I'm very committed as our next senator to making sure that we work uh, all across the community to stamp out any instances where that's occurring. Um, uh, Mr. Ralph is absolutely correct. Chief Anderson, um, we are so proud of our, our police chief and our, our local law enforcement for how they handled the, uh, the incident at the mall. Um, and I'm very much committed to making sure that our local law enforcement get the resources that they need from the state to be able to do their jobs and keep us safe. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that I have been endorsed by the police because of my commitment to that. Uh, our officers um, face a, a lot of challenges from driving to uh, having to investigate crimes and de-escalate situations. Uh, we need to make sure that, that there are resources in place that they get world-class training. So again, we've got to do everything we can throughout the state to make sure that um, everybody gets a fair shot, everybody gets a good opportunity, and again, there is no room for, uh, for discrimination in the state of Minnesota. Jerry Ralph, because you went first, we give you up to a minute to add anything to your original answer. The only thing that I would add is, is that as a state senator, you only get one in the district. I have to represent everybody. That means everybody from every, every aspect of the community, every segment of the community. And what my job is, is to take their, their concerns to the state and use my influence to develop policy that will help bring about this harmony that we would like to see. So that is my commitment, that I will represent everyone in the district from both sides of the aisle and carry ideas down to the Senate that will help foster a community that is together. Thank you. All right, let's move to our uh, next question. This will be starting off with Dan Wildemont. Uh, without a special session, a bonding bill looks to be out of reach for 2016. How would you have worked towards a bonding bill uh, getting one passed, or would you oppose one altogether? Uh, I am a, uh, a strong supporter of day one. We have got to pass a robust bonding bill. Um, for those who might not be experts on, on bonding bills, it's a, uh, uh, there are a lot of projects at stake, uh, public infrastructure projects, uh, that typically get passed in even number of years. There are sometimes uh, smaller bonding bills in odd number of years. Um, and there were a lot of key projects locally that uh, did not get the support they need from the state because of the gridlock in the legislature. And again, that's one of the biggest reasons I'm running. I work as a realtor here in our community. So my job is bringing people together to, to reach agreements. Uh, every day I work as hard as I can in my client's best interest uh, to get them top dollar. But ultimately, it's my job to reach out to other agents from other offices. We'll try and put a deal together that, guess what, both sides aren't always 100% happy with. But we work in good faith, and we find a solution that's mutually beneficial enough, and we move forward. And we've really lost that in our politics these days. So um, uh, uh, absolutely, we've got to have a strong bonding bill that, uh, and, and local projects got to fi be fixed right away. Um, there's money for security upgrades to our prison here in St. Cloud that are much needed. Uh, there's money for our, our veterans at the, for the Minnesota National Guard Armory here in St. Cloud. And extremely important, there's renovations for Eastman Hall here on campus. Um, if you've all seen Eastman Hall, it's, a, it's an empty gym now. But with some help from the state and with our elected officials coming together, we can transform that into a world-class health center. This is so exciting. It's a built historic building built back in 1929 with $225,000 from the state. We get to double down on that investment, take this historic building, and transform it into a 21st century health center. We have got to come together. We've got to pass a bonding bill. And that's what I'm committed to doing on day one. All right, Jerry Ralph, same question. You've got two minutes. 
Without a special session, a bonding bill looks to be out of reach for 2016. How would you have worked towards getting a bonding bill passed, or would you have opposed one altogether? Oh, first of all, we do have to have a bonding bill. We have to have roads. We have to have bridges. There is, uh, my opponent has referred to the special projects here on St. Paul State, which I totally support, and which were in the bill. I think what we need to do is back up for a minute and ask ourselves why. Why didn't this happen? Part of the reason is that there is this go along, go along, go along, and then all of a sudden when we get to the end of the session, everybody is trying to get things done all at once. What I would like to see worked on as a policy matter is to try to push back the budget process, to make goals set early, to get people the information they need in the legislature to be able to form conclusions that will allow us to reach agreement on the bonding bill, that will allow us to cross party lines if necessary and make arrangements and agreements. Uh, I also have to refer to the fact that my experience, as I referred to in my opening statement, is as an attorney, and as an attorney dealing with adverse parties, and I'm not talking about just people who want to buy and sell a house. I'm talking about people who are throwing rocks at each other. And throughout my life as an attorney, it was my job to get those people to come together, to sit down in the same room, and reach an agreement, which I did. So I believe that with some changes in the procedures down at the, at the legislature, and with good people who want to get the job done working together, I think we can get a bonding bill. I think we can reach agreement, and I think we can get, we can heal some of this partisanship. So that's kind of what I'm committed to doing, is to try to go down and build good relationships, use my skills to try and help people to come together on solutions. Thank you. Right, and well, Monica, if you want first with this question, you get a, up to a minute to add anything to your answer. Uh, yes, um, <coughs> one of the, uh, the biggest things I was disappointed with with our current senator, John Peterson, um, neither Mr. Elf nor I are our current senator. Um, our, our current senator actually was the tie-breaking vote to defeat a bonding bill in the Senate that had, had resources for all those key projects. And um, I was very disappointed. Again, it was uh, just a classic case of partisan politics, political games at their worst. Um, I took on our senator and um, you know, challenged him as to why would he vote against those key projects. And uh, Mr. Elf actually attacked me for that in the St. Cloud Times. Um, and said that he would not have, have supported that. So um, I'm consistently committed to passing a bonding bill and uh, will continue to be day one as our next senator. Okay, moving on to our third question then. This is going to uh, Gary Ralph. You've got two minutes to respond to this. As you know, sexual assault continues to be a concern on college campuses. Do you support the passage of an affirmative consent law in Minnesota? Damn. All right, well, first of all, um, I'd like to just back up on a, a moment, if I might. Uh, I think there was a misstatement made here, and I want to correct it. There were several votes that were cast against the bill. No one single senator cast the deciding vote. And I want to make that very clear, and I made that clear in the op-ed that I, that I published in the paper. This is not an attack against Mr. Wolfman. It was simply a recitation of the facts. Now, with respect to sexual assault, I served on the board of Anna Marie's Alliance, which is the uh, battered women's shelter for almost 10 years. So I'm very well familiar with women's issues and with the issues that women who have been abused and sexually attacked are facing. Now, the question is, is should we have an affirmative consent law? My question is, is what wrong is that statute intended to correct? We have to think about this. What is affirmative consent? A woman says yes. Does that mean she no longer can say no? No is a much more powerful word than yes. We have laws on the books now that deal with and protect people who are vulnerable, who are under the influence of chemicals, who have physical disabilities. These laws protect those people. And we should use those laws to help make the campus safe. So I agree that we need to provide every possible support for women 
who are placed in a situation of sexual assault, they should not be treated as second-class citizens. They should have all of the protections of the law. So again, this is an example of critical thinking. What is this law intended to prevent? Thank you. And we'll let you got two minutes to answer the same question. Sexual assault continues to be a concern on college campuses. Do you support the passage of an affirmative consent law in Minnesota? Well, this is a, a very personal question for me. Um, uh, Lily is a fourth grader, uh, but before we know it, she'll be sitting here in a, in a chair on a college <laughs> campus. And uh, absolutely, I want to make sure that, that her and her classmates and, and every um, student here at St. Cloud State can feel safe. And um, uh, affirmative consent law is also known as yes mean less, yes, um, uh, means that for uh, sexual uh, contact to, conduct to be consensual, um, that a, uh, a, uh, both participants give an affirmative yes. Uh, right now, the status quo, and, and, the, and the yes means yes, affirmative consent laws have been um, passed in a number of states already and on a number of campuses. Um, right now, the status quo, and no means no, um, uh, gives the default benefit of the doubt to an abuser. And there are numerous studies and numerous cases that show that oftentimes if a woman is under attack, uh, sometimes she will you know, lock down or separate herself from a situation. There are a number of reasons why an a unconsensual sexual partner is not in a, have the ability to say no. Um, so we need to make sure that we have good laws uh, here on campus and in the state of Minnesota that protect everyone on our campus. Um, I would certainly be open to uh, supporting a affirmative consent law, um, one that both is able to protect our, our students here on campus and um, hold abusers accountable. Jerry Ralph, because you answered this question first, you get it up to a minute to amend your answer. answer. The issue here, folks, is consent. If a person is impaired or they are under some disability, any consent that they give, and this is what black letter law, any consent they give is, is invalid. So to say that in order to have consensual sex, a person must say yes affirmatively, belies and begs the question. Again, we must examine the purpose for which the law is being passed. Now, that being said, I am certainly in favor of a properly crafted law that expands the rights of women to protect themselves in situations where they don't have control, or even in situations where they are either under the influence or otherwise being influenced by some outside force. But I think we need to very carefully and critically examine how this law is to be drafted. Thank you. All right, our fourth and last question, we'll start off with uh, Dan Wolgamont. You've got two minutes to answer this question. Minnesota is becoming more economically and racially diverse, and that is reflected in our schools. How do you plan on closing the student achievement gap in our K-12 schools? Um, one of the, the biggest reasons that I'm, uh, that I'm running this campaign for the Senate is uh, education. And I think that uh, to start to close the achievement gap in Minnesota, we have got to make strong investments in early childhood education. Um, I know from experience with my daughters and experience in volunteering in my daughter's uh, kindergarten classroom how critical those, those first years are, how formative a child's mind is. And um, right now in the state of Minnesota, uh, only 15% of four-year-olds attend a, uh, a public early learning program. That ranks us among the lowest in the entire country. And very sadly then, it's no surprise that as a result, um, about 40 to 50 percent, 40 to 50 percent of, of kids in kindergarten class aren't prepared for kindergarten. So from day one, before they even get into kindergarten, they're already at a, uh, an educational comparative disadvantage with their peers. Um, that's, that's unacceptable. Minnesota. We've got to turn that around. So uh, one of the biggest things I want to do right from the get-go is to start working towards um, increasing access to uh, early learning and early childhood education so that from day one we can start uh, from day one of a child's 
life, we can, of, of a child's uh, school life, kindergarten, uh, we can work towards closing that achievement gap. Right. Jerry Ralph, you've got two minutes uh, to respond to this question. Again, Minnesota is becoming more economically and racially diverse, and that's reflected in our schools. How do you plan on closing the student achievement gap in K through 12 schools? Well, first of all, I think that what we need to do is examine why the gap exists. And early childhood education is not the only answer. That's true. So, thank you, appreciate that. Um, so what we need to do, I believe, is provide the school districts with tools to attack the gap. Let's take the fact that there are children who are not learning at the same level that others. Let's put programs in place that bring children to competency, for example, in third grade that they should be able to at least read English by sixth grade. They should be able to read and write English, and they should be getting to learn simple math. And by 12th grade, they should reach the level of, of education where they can pass a proficiency exam that would allow them to, be, uh, to become a student at a, at a Minsky University. Now, how do we do that? First of all, we have to look at the local school boards to help promote and to pro provide programs and curricula that lead to that. That means, let's get the, the, the control back to the local school boards. Once they've decided on programs that they think are important, then we need to seek funding for those programs. And I am strongly in favor of funding to help close that gap by making sure every child gets a good education and that every child, when they come out of school, can read, write, and do math. That, to me, is the critical part of the, of, the, of the program. I think early childhood is fine. I think it should be voluntary. And I think it should not necessarily be forced on, on parents to send their kids to a public early childhood program. I think a more nurturing early childhood program in a private uh, enterprise is just as beneficial, and maybe more so, than in a, than in a public school. Dan Woldemont, as you answer this question first, you've got up to a minute to add to your answer. Uh, just one thing I also want to add is um, I want everyone here to know that I really strongly uh, want to continue to support um, all-day kindergarten in Minnesota. Uh, that was something that uh, Representative Dorholt, who you'll hear from soon, um, was able to work towards uh, back in the 2013 session. And uh, I know from, from my experience when Lily was in kindergarten, getting to go all day, uh, just really we saw leaps and bounds um, improvement with her personally. So. Um, just also want to add that part of closing the achievement gap, um, part of uh, just really making sure that all of our kids, no matter you know what neighborhood you're from, no matter what your zip code is, all of our kids deserve a world-class education. All right, Back. we're done with our questions, but we've got now uh, two minutes for closing statements. So, Jerry, would you mind doing two, uh, two minutes for closing statements? All right. What I really want to bring to your attention is, first of all, I want you to think about the answers that have been given here. Do you want a candidate that has specific proposals, that doesn't talk in generalities, who brings maturity to the, to the program, who has the life experience to be able to create those specific answers? If you listen to the answers that we've been given, I have given, I've outlined specific programs in every case, in cases of policy, in cases of what we should do to support the school board, in cases of what we should do about sexual assault, every single thing is a specific program. And that is the expertise that I bring to this job. As a Marine officer, I learned that leadership is earned, not just inherited, that one earns leadership through respect. I also learned that in order to get people to work together, you have to get them to think alike. And that is what I do. I appreciate your time. My name is Jerry Ralph. I, I ask for your vote in November. Thank you very much. Jerry Ralph just attacks the organization. Well, again, I'm Dan Walgamot, and I just want to give such a heartfelt thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Um, uh, Talking about earning respect, I've uh, worked very hard to meet a lot of you uh, in your dorms and in your apartments, and I'll continue to do that. Um, 
there's, there's so much potential, there's so much um, excitement in this room with each and every one of you here. And uh, as if elected, our next mm -hmm. senator, I'll continue to reach out to you. I want to be a very accessible, very strong advocate for, uh, for students and for our colleges and universities here. And um, I, uh, uh, again, appreciate you being here. And I, I ask that you take my willingness to reach out to you and listen to you and uh, be in tune with your needs and uh, with your priorities and uh, take my experience as a realtor, as a football coach, as a parent, and uh, send me to St. Paul to tackle your priorities. Thank you very much.